but it's not on the left. Alrighty, I think we did it. <laughs> we are live. So hello, happy. It's Thursday, isn't it today? It's, uh, I feel like I haven't done a series on solutions in a while. So I'm wrapping my head back around Thursday. So hello and happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And a huge welcome to our guest of honor today, Yasmin Ostor, who's going to be uh, chatting with us about the Green Art Lab Alliance. And you're joining us from Mexico City. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, bombard you with a couple of questions about that later because I just am so excited about the work that you're doing down there. But before we get uh, get rolling with that, I'd love to back up and talk a little bit more about what you're doing with Green Art Lab Alliance. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what that is and um, and then we can take it from there. Great. Yeah. I mean, we've been around for almost 10 years now, wow. which is quite amazing. Like we started in 2012, initially as a, like an EU funded project uh, okay. to form a knowledge alliance of, of organizations. So at the time, the partners were also all based in Europe with a couple of what they call third, third country uh, partners. Uh, so we were also working with uh, Georgia and Singapore, who are not considered oh. EU. Well, Singapore still not considered EU. And um, from then, like we had, so we had quite a bit of funding for the first like three years, and we did a lot of events and, and workshops. And the focus at the time was very much on. One thing really understanding as a cultural organization, environmental footprint. So one of the key partners uh, in helping organizations with that is what is Julie's Bicycle in London. So really, um, yeah, like the nuts and bolts of understanding, you know, where you, what you do with water, waste, energy, mobility. Um, yeah, really also like the building that a lot of cultural organizations you know, are also located in buildings, whether that's museums or galleries or opera houses or dance studios, whatever. So it was on one side very practical. And then there was another kind of strand of activities, which was more uh, around experiment and research. And that was kind of structured in the form of residencies because a lot of the partners are residency programs. Oh, cool. Uh, um, and so we had the chance to do a lot of work around you know, materials and, and then after those few years, we kind of naturally grew into partnerships uh, in Asia, so with 15 more partners and somehow the conversation also diversified, obviously, because of that, but also became, yeah, I guess, more holistic. So the, there was maybe less focus on really the the, the, the science, the data, the carbon, but it also became a conversation about, you know, relationship to the land and the ancestors mm -hmm. and spirituality and, yes, yeah, so, and food, actually. Um, so that was really important and really interesting. And so started to have more exchange also between those continents. And now in more recent years, we also have another... 20, yeah, I think 20 organizations uh, working wow. as part of the Alliance here uh, in Latin America. And you can imagine, you know, that the conversation became even richer, you know, yeah. also talking, of course, about colonial legacies and plantation mindsets and, um, yeah, the, the political narrative, I think, also became mm -hmm. uh, much more present in, in what we do. So yeah, and we are now 50 organizations collaborating in various different ways. So both like through more like general assemblies where people get to meet each other like per continent, but then also uh, through themes, so through working mm -hmm. groups, um, mm -hmm. and then also through resources that, you know, different partners are developing. So that could be 
a funding guide, for instance, on opportunities, you know, at the intersection of art and ecology, or mappings of, you know, who are, who is doing what um, at the intersection of art and ecology in a specific geography, in a specific country. Mm. Um, yeah, various different resources that are useful for the partners and then these. Oh, I think we froze. Oh, there we go. We're back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you Brilliant. hear the last thing I said? No, just the last part. Could you repeat that one? I, yeah, so that the working group are also active and we're working around eight different themes at the moment from cool. you know, and biodiversity to ocean river to ecocide to future materials so um yeah it's really interesting to see what's been coming out of these working groups too yeah absolutely and you guys have put together so many amazing resources and i know that we actually first connected um over the future materials uh database and um I'm, if anyone has not checked out the future materials database please do so i will um ask my social media team to put it in the link uh but it's it's just a phenomenal resource but um since we have the founder here <laughs> would you tell us a little bit about what the future materials uh data bank is sure yeah yeah so it initially started, I was still working at the Jan van Eyck Academy at the time, uh, mm -hmm. which is a postgraduate like, residency program institute in the Netherlands. And I noticed that a lot of the artists kind of working there were very interested in, you know, working around issues with climate change or the Anthropocene or, you know, much more of like a conceptual or intellectual engagement with this topic. Mm -hmm. But there was somehow bit of a lack of knowledge in the, the, the materials that they decided to use in order to transmit that message. So yes. th that was a little bit <laughs> problematic. Um, and so I started a partnership with uh, Central St. Martins in London with an mm -hmm. MA called Materials Futures. And um, they've been doing already amazing research, research on you know, mater materials and have amazing facilities and labs, you know, to do all sorts of um, research. And so the course leader of Material Futures came to the Van Eyck for six months to set up like a physical material library so people could, you know, touch and smell and find out about all these interesting uh, alternatives that are out there, you know, alternatives for you know the the, the non chemical or non mm, yeah non toxic alternatives to glues and polymers and you know for pigments and dyes and ecosynthetics and textiles and fibers and biomaterials like some amazing things so then I had this beautiful kind of library in my office and then the pandemic kind of you know happened. Oh so, yeah, that thing. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> Which also meant you know, that everyone's office is closed, including this material library. But that mm. was kind of also an instigator to to turn it into an online like database or bank, as we call it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the materials that are uh, in that physical material library are also on the future materials bank which is not you know a website yeah. online platform but then we also decided to make it open source so that other people could also contribute their, with their materials and that's actually been amazing because that really helped like, diversify both the materials and the makers that are in there and also allowed to us to have like much more of a I guess a discourse, an international discourse around, you know, the so social circumstances that the materials have been made in order, the amount of water that's needed to make to make the material, or what is the afterlife of the material, uh, what is ethical foraging, you know, territory, where do you get it from? Yeah. So that's actually 
the 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 bank is proven to be like this incredible trigger for conversation and and discourse around materials and we very consciously called it future materials and not mm -hmm. new materials um because it's not just about new materials it can also be traditional materials or indigenous techniques it, it's more about uh, what are the materials that we want to take into our future? You know, which materials are future-proof? So yes. it immediately forces us to think about what does this desirable future or sustainable future look like? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. And I love that you guys did future. And as, as many of the audience members know, we have key futures. And it's yeah. that same concept. It's about, you know, envisioning the future and what the future looks like and what we want to, we, how we want to create it and co-creating it together. So I'm, I'm, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I love also what you were talking about with the, the way that you thought about the materials in terms of a holistic approach. And indeed, not just looking at materials for their user value, but also where did they come from? Where did they go? Taking that whole life cycle into consideration in terms of environmental impact, but also the extraneous things that you might not think about. I mean, you know, I, there's a lot of discussion now a days about, you know, how much how much uh, water it takes to make a pair of blue jeans. It's something like, what is it, like 30,000 liters or something it's ridiculous crazy. like that? It's insanely yeah. high. Yeah. Um, and so that added element of understanding not only, okay, this is a plastic water bottle, and so it uses plastic and it, produce, it ends up being plastic, but also what are the other elements? And also that social component, which is yeah. so important. Yeah. And, you know, it, I think this is a really eloquent demonstration of sustainability on a holistic level, because it is about the material, but you have, there's, you know, everything's connected. And I also love what you were saying about, um, you know, bringing in not just future materials and thinking like modern and synthetic or new and shiny consequently has to be better, but also taking a look at more traditional techniques. Um, you know, this as, as a conservator, this has been something that's been on my mind for many years. Um, you know, why are we, why does shiny and new equal better you know we we got along without synthetic glues for thousands of years and all of a sudden now we're using you know everything there. yeah the technology is there and i i think that's that's for me that's personally very very interesting but i don't know if you have uh any experience you'd like to share about a traditional material that perhaps you've used in your own experience um that's a that kind of exemplifies this for for us Gosh, there's so many. I mean, <laughs> just, like the first thing that's on my mind, but it's not uh, per se like something that I've worked with, but I want to mention it because I think it, uh, it comes with a lot of interesting questions around mm -hmm. also ownership and who has access to knowledge and, you know, who can use it. Um, like I've been here in Mexico collecting some... Uh, not physically collecting materials, but I'm working on making a collection in the bank, like a Mexican collection. So the collection is the, the bit on the, on the website where we group certain materials together that are kind of curated by one person saying like, oh, like for, for now we only have like a sea collection, for instance, so all materials that come from the sea. Oh, wow. So with this Mexican collection, I've been looking, you know, there's the, the, the fibers of the maguey, the, the, I can't even think of the English word. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's like several really interesting materials that definitely need to go into the bank, I think. And then there is this, there is this purple pigment that comes from a snail. Oh, and that's a fun uh, very, resource. <laughs> very like it, it's very valuable because i mean you don't actually kill the snail for it but you milk the snail to get this pigment and it's really strong and it really so looks like it lasts it's super beautiful um but there is only one uh community here in 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 mexico in the south that is 
domestic people who are who kind of have the rights to milk this snail because if everyone does this um you know the the snail is also threatened to extinction yeah of course which there has already been a period where you know it has been kind of over milked it's also you know about how much you take and who has the the rights to take or has the knowledge to do it in the right way and so i think it's it's also interesting showing that it's not uh that the 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 solution let's say or the the um, solution is not really the right word the key is in the plurality Mm -hmm. so there is not one pigment or one glue that is the the alternative for all the toxic ones but it's actually the 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 plurality of of biodiversity plants exactly it's exactly (laughs) yeah absolutely Um, that is also i think what the what the bank wants to show there's not one material that is the solution for something Mm -hmm. but it shows that there is actually a lot of different options and the, the the more diverse or the more different more choices yeah we, use, we start growing different plants and we start eating different foods and vegetables and that is actually also then you know a different role that we as people can play as creators of biodiversity and as mm. dispersers of seeds and that's a whole different narrative to climate change than the human as a destructor of the environment. Mm -hmm. I I think that's so beautiful. And I love that you brought this up because indeed, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. There are so many different elements here about, you know, humans and the consumer society and also indeed humans as destructors. But if we stop seeing ourselves as separate from nature and seeing it as part of that ecosystem, we have a huge role to play in promoting and safeguarding biodiversity and indeed, you know, promoting biodiversity because we do have different needs. And, you know, there are so many elements here, not just in terms of material use and just having multiple options, which as a conservator, I can tell you that, um, you know, every artifact, every object that we get into contact with has a unique need and unique problem. And so it would be nice to not as a conservator, just think, okay, well, I use this and that's the material I use, but to have a variety of options and say, actually, this is the best in this particular situation. Here's why. And this is the best in this situation. Here's why. Um, But it goes into so many different elements. And I think it's interesting to see the, um, the parallels between things like human health and um, and biodiversity in this context of material use, and particularly for me as a conservator in art conservation, and of course as an artist in you know creating your artworks, because you want different elements, you want different, you have different requirements, and so it's amazing to think about that nature can provide all of that, and um, or that humans can provide some of it, and. This going back to what you're saying about you know using natural things and um, being respectful of that, I always find it interesting. Um, there's a a big conversation in the I always go back to conservation because I'm a conservator uh, in the conservation world about uh, agar agar, which is used as a gel for um, cleaning. Um, artworks. And it's great because it's super sustainable. It's not toxic for the conservator. It's not toxic for the planet. Um, But the problem is, is that agar agar is so over farmed because of the um, jelly industry, the gummy bear industry, (laughs) that it's actually an endangered species. And consequently, the use of it is is not as sustainable as we think it is because of the way that it's produced and the way that it's over farmed, and um, you know those those situations make things more complicated because you think you look at a natural material and you just automatically think oh it's sustainable because it's natural, but this is also where that holistic approach comes into play. And so yeah, I I, yeah. I love that you well, that you brought that up. When 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 uh, when a certain plant is extremely efficient it can mm-hmm. also become too 
successful and just create like monoculture basically i mean this yes. is also the case with with palm oil you know it's not because palm oil in itself is so problematic yeah but it's just the scale <laughs> of all of these monocultures and 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 the consequences of of uh the monocultures being deforestation exactly it's it's corn just, same it's thing not that in itself that it's evil yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. And it's, it is interesting because palm oil is actually a super sustainable plant. But the problem indeed, as you said, is deforestation. People are cutting yeah. down rainforests all over Indonesia and South and in the Asia Pacific area um, to plant palm oil because it's in such high demand. I mean, it's in almost everything you go to the grocery store. It's in everything. It's in exactly. peanut butter. It's in, you know, your cooking oil. It's, it's so and it's so but yeah, but it's, I mean, it's this, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, the, the problem is that, is that plantation mindset. Yes. Uh, and not the, the plant. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, this, this could, we could go off and do a whole tangent over here about GMOs. <laughs> But, you know, just kind of bringing this back to, uh, I touched earlier on, you know, human health and it's the same thing. Like I'm, I'm gluten intolerant. That's not by choice. I have an allergy and gluten intolerance is becoming more and more prevalent because of the way we process our foods and because of these monocultures and traditionally humans had much more diversity in their diets and consequent, and that diversity actually helps boost our immune systems and helps regulate all of our internal organs. And when we start eating only one type of corn that's been genetically modified that's in everything we do then it actually starts affecting our bodies and then we can't tolerate things um so it's it's interesting the the parallel here between materials that we use as as cultural professionals and also how closely that relates to the issues of biodiversity for human health and planetary health yeah. no and biodiversity is also biosecurity because it means when you know something happens to one plan, not everything is depending on that one species. That's true. Yeah, I mean, that's true. That is that also. I mean, of course, you know, we cannot make a whole connection also with the pandemic. And, oh my gosh! Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> are, yeah. Are yeah, and I. Yeah, and I do find it interesting. I remember when when COVID first came out. Um, and there was all of this research coming out about the link between loss of biodiversity, deforestation, and COVID. And yeah. I was talking with someone about that. They're like, what do you, that, huh? Like, how, how does that relate to each other? But indeed, basically the COVID pandemic was caused because the bats were being, you know, de deforestation of the areas where the bats were living and loss of biodiversity, which led to this, this pandemic. And yeah, what's- and a general increase in zoonotic diseases, you know, because yes. of this affinity between humans and animals. Exactly. And it's what's scary is that because this is becoming more and more prevalent, this, yeah. you know, the, the discussion was that this could be the first of how many pandemics. Yeah. And um, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of over it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't mind wearing a mask and I'm, you know, vaccinated and I'm grateful that we were able to get a vaccine so quickly, but I think uh, it is, it is scary to think that, you know, this is just the first and that's, yeah. that's what's scary. And it's, yeah. I find it interesting because you can almost relate it to the climate change um, phenomena that we see with natural disasters happening more and more frequently. You know, there was a hurricane in New Orleans, um, about a month, two months ago, and it was the second worst hurricane to hit New Orleans in history after Katrina, of course. And, you know, hurricanes like that used to happen once every 500 years. And then now it was 17 years after Katrina. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, I mean, I don't think it was nationally covered because they were more prepared for it. So there weren't um, very many casualties, but, and, it, but it was just, you know, this is just yeah. happening all the time. And it's the same, like, you don't want to see that trend happen with pandemics as well. You know, natural disasters more and more frequent. Now we've got pandemics more and more frequent. Like, that's yeah. scary. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> precarity is the new normal. But that's also, like, I don't know if I already mentioned, but why, like, a lot of my research and also, like, the, 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 the thinking and the model let's say of of the alliance is uh really 
very much in the direction of like fungal thinking and mycelium because yes. looking at the fungus is actually like for for fungi precarity is like an or crisis are an opportunity for forming new relationships for forming new so, bonds um and if you yeah if you look at if you make the the the, the let's say i don't you know connection with with human societies or what you know this this more than anything has shown our um has shown the interdependentness also between between people like the mutual dependencies like suddenly you needed your neighbor for all these things like to help you with whatever or um yeah it, it created it strengthened also a lot of communities and yeah at the same time i think that the this way of working which now i'm mostly looking at the at the mycelium or to be more precise at the mycorrhizal networks so the mycorrhizal networks really have create bonds between like plants and and the fungus that are mutually okay. beneficial so they uh they literally depend on each other to exchange resources you know for oh, interesting the, okay the, it's like the extension almost of of the roots of a plant that is the fungus that's the mycelium and that allows for the plant then to access you know other minerals water nutrition that it would not be able to reach like have access to without the fungus and in return you know gives nutrients to the fungus so and i feel like with with the alliance it's also being able to reach uh well resources and <laughs> nutrition knowledge information whatever that otherwise we would not have access to mm -hmm. but because we realize this mutual dependency uh there is a willingness to to share to share these resources because we know like i'm gonna get better if you're better you know if you're that. in a good state i'm in a good state and uh yeah, that's just been really exciting also actually to see like as as part of the pandemic that the, the alliance really you know kind of exploded in a in a good in a good way that there was so much more willingness to do things and it's completely I don't know like ever since the EU funding ended like 7 years ago mm -hmm. it's been a completely unfunded alliance so there wow. is a lot of resources going around but they're all non-monetary nice um, and that's also made it really interesting to to think of resources or to think of value in a in a way that doesn't actually involve money but everyone yeah. is in for another reason you know because you still get something out of it there's value there yeah and i think i think i just love the way that um that this kind of organically came about. And I love what you're talking about, about, you know, the interdependency and, and that relationship building. And I think that that's something incredibly valuable. And I, I actually had a conversation with another, um, guest on, on a series for solutions a couple months ago about biomimicry and we talked yeah. and he, he's actually, uh, he's a microbiologist and specializes in um, fungal relationships. And uh, actually, oh, I should amazing. introduce you to him. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll, I'll set that up. But, um, but anyway, but we were, you know, chatting about this. And I think what's, what's been, I don't want to say kind of lost, but indeed, like I was, I was reading an article about um, kind of the way that society has lost that relationship, that that mutually beneficial relationship with nature and how it's very much about take, 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 and there's no give. And so, and I've just been really inspired by looking at going back to nature and looking at how it is so, um, there, there are so many relationships that are interdependent and helpful for each other. I found this really interesting. I'm actually, I'm in um, the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina right now. And this is actually the second most biodiverse place in the world, which um, is really, really cool. And I'm having a great time learning about all of the mushrooms and woolly worms and different plants that you can eat. 
And um, I went on a foraging trip a couple a uh, couple months ago, and um, the our guide told us that poison ivy is actually not um, damaging or dangerous for any other being except for humans. Mm -hmm. And poison ivy actually basically it started because it is protecting the other plants in the area from humans. Yeah. So when, um, when there's an area that's kind of under threat from human invasion, as so to speak, poison ivy jumps up to say, you know, this is nature's barrier oh, wow. back <laughs> off. Yeah, exactly. And I just found that amazing. Poison ivy does not affect dogs. It doesn't affect any other species. And actually there are a lot of animals that can eat poison ivy and get nourishment from it. And it is literally there as a protective barrier to yeah, humans. Yeah. <laughs> and what I find also really interesting with mycelium, for instance, it is mm -hmm. also a communication network through okay, which so cool. like plants can be warned against predators. So if there is, wow. there might be an, an insect that is completely like gnawing away at a, a tree, mm -hmm. the mycelium transports that information to the rest of the trees and uh, like it, it can change the, I think it's the enzyme or at least like the scent that it gives off so that the insect is not attracted to the other ones anymore. So it's a really wow. important, like, not just like resource exchange, but also a communication network. Well, I, I kind of have a feeling that we have something to learn there too. <laughs> um, um, why I'm like, all oh, the knowledge is there, but it's, yeah. you know, it's actually underground. And it's <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we're, we're all looking here and we need to be looking here. That's, that's just, that's so inspirational. And I think, um, it's, it's so funny because, you know, the more I learn about this, and this is a very much a new field for me, you know, um, and I've, I've really delved into my biomimicry really only in the last year. Um, but I find it so fascinating because you see some of the issues that we have as humans and in our society and in our relationships with nature and our relationships to each other and our relationship with mm -hmm. the future, et cetera. And you actually indeed could see that nature itself already has solutions for that. And yeah. I think part of it is just experience. You know, nature is a lot older than people are, so they've developed mechanisms yeah. for that. But it's 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 so funny because like, you know, key culture was founded on this idea of like, you know, working together and communic better communication and, you know, polycentricity, but in a way that's, you know, mutually beneficial. And, you know, I think Green Art Lab Alliance is similar, um, but, you know, it, it, look at the mushrooms. That's that's where we need to get our inspiration from. I just think yeah. that's so cool. <laughs> well, the, teaching, the teachings are there. It's just yeah. like in careful observation. That's phenomenal. Because you were in Brazil um, last year doing research on yeah, fungal relationships. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the research is ongoing. Okay, um, great. So the research is, is ending up in this book that I'm writing wow. called um, Mycelium as Methodology. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, I mean, which is basically about these things that we've been talking about now, you know, what are these teachings from the mycelium, but also how do we translate them into how we form communities, activist movements, um, you know, food distribution schemes or Amazing. other kind of decentralized oh. forms of exchange or collaboration, mm -hmm. um, including like all of these lessons that will be implemented course in the alliance so in terms of decision making processes and yeah increasing how kind of non hierarchical structures and, and mutual dependencies Amazing. Um, but yeah as, as part of that research i thought i wanted to kind of become a bit fungal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i love that <laughs> can i join you actually <laughs> <laughs> weirdly enough so so cool. I, I uh yeah I quit my job at the academy and I got rid of all of my possessions to move to a shiitake farm in uh in Minas Gerais in rural Brazil to uh to just be able to be with the mushrooms every day and to understand you know also issues of of uh time for instance like the time frame in which they grow was 
um, completely mesmerizing because I would mm -hmm. harvest them every day, like, you know, four or five hours per day, I'd be harvesting them. And then sometimes I would finish harvesting and I would look at the first block again, like the first mycelium block, and I'd be like, I'm sure I took these mushrooms off, but they're- Oh my gosh. Like, what's going on? Am I going crazy or? So it was like a really interesting, really, and sometimes, you know, they're really, looked like a family and it's like oh i don't really want to harvest those because i want them to stay together so you create like these weird relationships with the mushrooms and i started dreaming about mushrooms a lot <laughs> so yeah i think that informed also uh a lot of my decisions now after and now you're in mexico maybe that's also interesting to to uh mention is I'm working with with a collective called Co Colectivo Anasijo, like a yeah mostly female art collective working with farmers mostly in the well in different parts of Mexico but a lot in the Milpa Alta region which is where mm -hmm. the old Milpas are and the Milpa is like a kind of traditional Nawa way of doing agriculture which is not so much about growing crops but more like a social cultural construct, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the social plays a very important role, um, but it's also a system in which the, the corn is, you know, um, a central crop, but then everything that starts growing around the corn or that starts living around the corn, uh, you know, is actually completely edible and amazing. So what I've oh, been wow. researching quite a bit is the wheat like watching which is actually a fungus that grows on the corn, which is considered also to be a pest, but it's also like a complete delicacy. So it's this black, oh. black fungus that grows on the corn, which is absolutely delicious. Oh, wow. um, and, but for instance, what also arrives, you know, when you have this whole milpa system is the crickets. And mm. the crickets, you know, are also eaten a lot here as a yeah. thing like, uh, source of protein. Yeah, so, I've had cricket tacos. They're delicious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really crunchy. <laughs> crunchy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like all the all the things that start growing is part of that. Like a lot of it is not even planted. Like we like bocce or the or the chapulines, the the, the, the crickets, mm -hmm. but they become part of this system of this. Yeah, this. Uh, yeah, system, I think, is the best word. Yeah. For it. it's well, I find these relationships really interesting. Yeah, I just, I think that's, that's so incredible. And, you know, it just reminds me so much of like the concept of circularity and yeah. regenerative models yeah. and, you know, the biological cycle and giving back to the earth something that can be regenerated and give more back to yeah. whatever, you know, systems are in place. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's just, it, it seems so simple and so straightforward. And it's, it's almost like, how did we get so far off in this direction? But I think that the exciting part and that what I'm really hopeful for is that we are as a species starting to understand better the connection we have with nature and how far gone that's gotten and starting to look back and realize that, as you mentioned, the answers are there and we just have to realize that we are part of that system not above that system and so i think that's really that's really powerful and it's just i i've always been so inspired by your work and what you what you do so um, oh, i'm grateful I mean, it's all of these partners doing all the work you know because yeah. again it's the plurality of their voices whether yes. it's colectivo amasijo working with the milpa in mexico whether it's listen to the city working with the with gentrification in Seoul, whether it's Bamboo Curtain Studio in Taiwan, working with the river, you know, it's it's the plurality of their voice that I think is is the yeah, where where the, that strength lies. And yes. I mean on top of that, it's really I mean we've been talking about how we need, you know, the answers are there, but it requires careful observation and but it also requires a different form of, of listening and yes. using the senses in a different way. And this is why for me, it's key to work with artists, not actually because I'm into 
the art scene so much I realized recently like, <laughs> well you're you're fungal now so <laughs> yeah. but that's a form of art it's just natural art right yeah, yeah. no but artists have like an incredible capacity to work with the senses you know and yes to, work to to see in different ways to listen in different ways to touch and and this is this is a, an entrance, I think, into, into uh, understanding and listening to nature in that way that it requires, like tuning yeah. into that, that different kind of frequency. Yeah. Yeah. So it's for me why the arts are super important as a, as a translator or mediator into repairing this relationship. I could not agree with you more. This is the power of culture is that capacity to indeed transcend just cold, hard facts or, you know, the written word on a computer screen. This is about emotional connection. And, uh, you know, this is something I always say to everyone is that that's why we as cultural professionals have to be leaders in this movement towards to sustainability, because we have that power to indeed connect with people. And it's interesting. I, I don't think I've ever used the term like multi-sensory levels, but you know, on a deep emotional, human, uh, yeah. compassionate level, empathetic level, and yeah, um, yeah it's it's just it's really. I think it's really it has been really eye opening for me to see that connection not only between our capacity as artists and cultural professionals, purveyors of human history, um, to connect with other people, but to connect with nature, and yeah. to also bring that connection to people who maybe, you know, have not had the chance to go to um, Brazil or Mexico and, and play with the mushrooms, um, you know, but still can gain an appreciation for nature, you know, even if they grew up in New York City or um, in Amsterdam or a place that you don't get as much expo exposition exposition to nature, exposure to nature. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's also really, really beautiful sentiment. And, um, you know, I, I just have to say to, to everyone, you know, check out the, the Green Art Lab Alliance website. There's so many amazing projects and resources on there. And it's just, it's so inspiring to see, um, yeah, indeed how much this has grown. Um, and as you said, like, there's no monetary exchange there. It's just this, this beautiful, cauldron of knowledge and passion yeah, and, and, and solidarity also somehow yeah right? solidarity apps that's yeah, such a good that's word like understanding that even though we are maybe geographically really far apart um there is a closeness there's a yes. closeness because we are like-minded people because we're trying to do the same thing because we're in it together and to realize that even though you don't speak the same language, you don't look the same, you know, you're on the other side of the world to realize that actually you don't need physical proximity to, to have solidarity, but like, I guess, mental proximity. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> really um, has, has shown also to be a great form of, of mental support, actually, for a lot of the partners, you know, who mm. have lost staff members or audiences or funding or whatever during a mm -hmm. pandemic and yeah I think the, the mental support side is also uh, quite an important one which is like a whole <laughs> there were conversations again that we could talk about eco anxiety and climate change. oh gosh no we're not going to get started <laughs> on that <laughs> no but but indeed I think and it one of the things that I always find really uh, motivating about my work at Key Culture is when people say, you know, I always felt so alone in this. And that was actually why I started Key Culture is because I felt so alone. I was a conservator who wanted to be more sustainable and felt that I had no support and no direction. And no, I was the yeah. only one. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. yeah, banging your head against a wall. And um, yeah. indeed, and, you know, finally, like being part of a network of people who indeed are like minded and have similar um, desires, but also similar uh, values. Yeah, it's, it's so powerful. And I think that once we see how big this network really is, and this is what I love about, you know, 
conversations with you and and conversations with other leaders of organizations is that you know it's not just the key culture network it's the green art lab alliance network and it's the we are museums network and it's the um museum and climate change network in australia you know there's so many different organizations working on this and the fact that all of a sudden the world is small enough that we can all communicate with each other is so powerful yeah. and um to unite these battles yes I mean, yes 100 percent they are essentially the same. We're using maybe different words or different strategies and methodologies, but we want the same thing. Yes, and I, I think that's another thing that I have found is really, really powerful, especially about being able to connect globally and internationally with people, uh, not just like-minded, but just other people, is being able to see that other people are people and being able to humanize someone in another country in another part of the world maybe someone with different political leanings or different um backgrounds you know we are all human and we all as you said we all have the same wants and needs and maybe we're coming at it from different directions but if we can build that bridge and make that connection of seeing other people for being human beings and recognizing yourself in them i think that that's um really powerful and also transcending that to recognize yourself within nature and seeing yeah. the similarities between there is the no mushrooms that doesn't want clean air clean oh my gosh or no. Healthy food, you know? so. no <laughs> there's not <laughs> it's not a political issue i'm sorry it's just not <laughs> you know when it when push comes down to shove you know i um it's i i mean i have to say this is a totally personal anecdote but I'm here in North Carolina and there is there are a lot of um, very right wing conservative Trump reporters and uh, Trump supporters in this area. And um, I uh, met someone and I always find it interesting to meet people and hear about them. And um, I was out with somebody and we were chatting and he was a big Trump supporter. And I and he's he was really shocked to find out that I was a liberal and oh, the liberals. And I was, anyway, um, and he said he said something or we were talking about climate change he's like you believe in climate change and i was like well i think you can see it like you know the way that we're damaging nature and he's like yeah i don't like damaging nature and i was like yeah yeah you like the planet don't you like this is a beautiful yeah. forest we have here isn't it and like he made some comment later about like oh it's better for the environment to do this and i was like see this is this is not a political issue <laughs> like this is people care about our planet because you know as you said we all have human needs as well yeah, and it's your personal benefit that you well can breathe <laughs> yeah that's helpful right and that you have clean water to drink and safe food to eat and that it doesn't damage you because you know it's it's yeah anyway we won't go down that road but <laughs> but i i do have to say i know we're running out of time here um but i always just find our conversation so inspiring and i think you know i yeah well thank you and you know i i think that for me um you know this is series on solutions and i i know that we've talked about some things that are a little bit scary but i think that um you know my biggest takeaway is indeed this idea that um the answers are there and that collaboratively collectively as partners and you know there are so many of us out there who want to work on this and work towards this and are involved in this movement of connecting sustainability and culture and the future and nature and this nexus is growing just more and more powerful every day and um you know as i said if anyone uh has not checked out green art lab alliance please check out the website there are so many beautiful inspiring stories on there and i would just love to thank you so much for all of the hard work that you do and for all of the beautiful work that you do it's yeah. really really inspiring <laughs> of course of course so um before i let you go i always ask everyone one final question and that is to leave our audience with an action point so if there is one thing that you can recommend that our audiences could do today to start being more sustainable what would it be yeah i was thinking about it to uh actually suggest for people to try and use different words. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, so look into, like to do maybe some, some research in what like other terms, uh, like equivalence to sustainability are used in different contexts. 
and to start like diversifying our language when we talk about this subject. Because something that really became very clear working with the Alliance is that, uh, well, particularly the word sustainability, but also climate change, or they don't resonate in the same way in every place. So if we can also diversify our, our language, um, I think we have more opportunities to see that we're wanting to do the same thing. It's very related actually to the example that you just gave about the guy who you met and you said, oh, but you know, you, you yeah. don't want to damage this. You know, it's because you used the word, oh, damage the forest rather than climate change. Mm -hmm. Because when climate change is like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, no, I don't need that. Or you know, the same can happen with sustainability or with, with other terms. So if we, if everyone can think, you know, about diversifying the terminology and, and you know, looking at what other cultures or people are, are using in terms of language, I think that could actually be really helpful in, uh, yeah, uniting battles. I could not agree with you more. And it's actually quite amazing that you, that you brought that up because I was literally having a conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday about this. And we were talking about um, accessibility of language and indeed terminology of sustainability. And um, you know, you say the word sustainability and in Western society, people immediately go to climate change. In um, a lot of my friends in South America, you say sustainability and they immediately go to human rights and social justice. You go to Mozambique and you say the word sustainability and people will look at you like, huh? Yeah. What? I, I've never heard of that because it's a Western white term. And, yeah. and also- it's like the equivalent of expensive because it means organic, you know, organic fruits, which is more expensive. Oh, interesting. And yeah, and I know that in Hungarian and also in Italian, there is not a word like in Italian, it's sustainability, but that doesn't have the same meaning. Mm -hmm. And so usually you use eco sustainability, but once again, that's with the environmental lens and that excludes the social aspect. Yeah. And I think it's so it's so interesting because indeed um, the words that we use will have such different meaning. And um, my friend and I were talking yesterday about this, and she was saying that you know, th like the term uh, zero waste that is a white Western term, and she's she's African American, and she's saying you know in the black community we always had zero waste. We just called it don't waste. Yeah. And I thought, well, that, you know, that's powerful. Like the practices are already there in a lot of cir circumstances, but yeah. people are not communicating with each other about it because they're using different terminology. So I love that. I think that's some, brilliant. Yeah, some of these terms can even be polarizing. and have Very much. So Very much. Let's, uh, let's diversify language. I love that. And I think, I think that's a perfect way to put it. And I think that climate change is one of those words, especially here in the United States, that is polarizing. Um, and as you, as you pointed out, you know, I came at it from a different angle. Well, <laughs> I didn't even know I pointed it out, <laughs> but indeed, you know, you come at it from a different angle with, with different terminology and all of a sudden people are on the same page. So I think, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, suggestion. And I would like, love to thank you for that. And um, yeah, recommend to everyone that uh, we start thinking more about what terms we're using and would love to hear from people about what words they use when they talk about things like what we're calling sustainability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much again, Yasmin. It's oh, been so, so much fun. Me. And thank you everyone for watching and we will see you in our next series on solutions. Thank you.